Hi, Oscar. Hi. Good to have you here. How are you? Fine, thanks, and you? Good, good, good. Thanks, we are very excited to have you here today. I'm also very excited to be here today. Um, so you're gonna tell us about your recent paper in small about um, synthetic organelles? Yes. Very nice paper. So you can uh, start sharing your screen, but maybe before you can introduce yourself with a few sentences. Sure. So, let me see. Here we go. I hope you can see the screen now. I can see it, yeah. correct. Okay. So, uh, Welcome, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Oskar Stalfe. I'm uh, now a postdoc at the uh, Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg, which is this uh, almost 90 year old building now that you can see in the back of, of my slides. And um, yeah, today I, I, I would like to present you the, our most recent uh, small paper on the bottom up assembly of functional synthetic organelles um, by droplet based microfluidics. It's an open access paper, so every one of you can, can read it freely. And uh, well, actually, I, I also would like to thank uh, the organizer of this meeting uh, for inviting me today. Um, I really hope looking at the, at the list of people that have been presenting in the seminar series before me that I can uh, share with you some of the exciting research and, and, and as the, the uh, presenters before me have done. And I'm also very much looking forward to have a discussion on the results because actually it's ongoing work. Yeah, it's, it's only the, the first steps that we were published in this paper. And uh, we are still very much into this topic and, and would like to even deepen our systems that we have developed. So um, first, actually, because I know it's quite of a interdisciplinary audience, so people with many different backgrounds, I would like to give you a quick introduction into the basic mindset of this project. Um, actually, I didn't mention that uh, I have a background in molecular biotechnology myself, so I'm somewhat of a biologist, I would say. And uh, we as biologists, we've been studying these basic units of life, the cells, since now many centuries. Yeah, so as shown in this time lapse uh, video, we have been studying how they adhere to, sur to surfaces, how they migrate over surfaces and so on. We've developed genetic engineering techniques on how structural components of these cells and functional modules that allow for that migration of, and adherence of these cells um, can be studied. And of course, with the help of physicists, we have developed uh, very sophisticated ultrastructural imaging techniques that allow us to understand and, and analyze these supramolecular structures inside living cells. So based on all these efforts within the last decades, I would say we've come up with quite good models that describe individual functional elements of cells like adhesion machineries, in this case, focal adhesions. And we've described many, many different protein components, for instance, within the system, actually, so many that we're start to losing maybe the focus on the understanding and of these systems in terms of their dynamics, in terms of their kinetics, um, because simply they are so complex and so diverse in their composition that we need new approaches to understand them, uh, as I said, in detail in their dynamic behavior. And within the last decade, more or less, I would say. Um, there's a new approach that emerged from the, mostly from the physical sciences that's called bottom-up synthetic biology. In this branch of uh, synthetic biology, we strive to construct minimal lifelike materials uh, in order to reconstitute kind of these interesting cellular phenomena in vitro. This means we try to break down the complexity of cellular functionalities and cellular structures um, by bottom-up reconstitution of specific phenomena in vitro. So for instance, we build synthetic cells, like shown in this um, um, fluorescence confocal microscopy 
time lapse um, that incorporate all the molecular um, building blocks that are necessary to build these tubulin spinals. And by this, we are able to study the dynamics of such a um, cellular system in a well-defined and isolated environment. By this, uh, I think bottom-up synthetic biology asks more, some of the most fundamental questions, as, uh, questions in life sciences, which is, for instance, where's the transition from matter to life? Um, can we actually integrate matter into living materials, so into living systems in order to analyze their behavior? And can we then understand and also engineer these lifelike systems on a quantitative level? And very much of my work, especially during my PhD, has focused on interfacing such synthetic cell systems or synthetic lifelike system, uh, systems with actual living cells in vitro in order to analyze the behavior of the living cells in a kind of a function of the synthetic cell system. Um, all of this, of course, requires some uh, sophisticated molecular systems engineering, so means and methods to assemble synthetic uh, materials that somehow mimic lifelike behaviors in a very controlled and quantitative manner. And the technique that we mostly use for this is droplet-based microfluidics. So I'm showing you here some of the um, different microfluidic modules that uh, we have in our group and that have been established by, by other groups. Um, and we basically use this droplet-based modules uh, for the generation of so-called water and oil droplets, which is shown in the upper left uh, time, time lapse. Um, and we, we use different other modules, like for instance, this PICO injection module, to sequentially um, modify these droplets um, to build up synthetic lifelike systems. So basically we use droplet-based microfluidics and their models for sequential assembly of, in this case, synthetic cells, but as I'm gonna show you also for the assembly of synthetic organisms. Um, and the, the, the main advantage is of course, that we can very precisely but in a high throughput, uh, adjust and engineer these uh, synthetic systems. Um, the very fundamental uh, chemistry behind our system will be explained now in this, um, in this slide. Uh, so it's a, a little bit of mechan uh, mechanistics behind the assembly of our uh, technology. In case I, I don't manage to explain to you clearly, I, I wanna take the, 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 the take home message already here before actually uh, showing you a slide if, if I don't manage to really explain this in, in detail. Um, what you need to know about the techniques that we use is that it's a high throughput production technique that allows for an exact control of these synthetic systems and it has a very high encapsulation efficiency for biomolecular components. So basically what we do is we generate these uh, water and oil droplets which are sketched here and we integrate liposomes into these droplets and any kind, if we want, of a biomolecule, it could be DNA, but it could also be RNA and proteins, sugars, and so on. What will happen, of course, is that these liposomes will diffuse within the droplet. And once they meet the droplet periphery, they will encounter a surfactant, which is, of course, needed to stabilize the droplet in, in the oil phase. And this surfactant is partly charged. In the aqueous layer, so in the water droplet itself, there's also some magnesium that will be directed to the periphery of, of this droplet. And the magnesium in turn will then lead um, uh, to a scenario where the, where the SUV, so these liposomes, will be dragged to the droplet periphery because of a charge-mediated interaction. At the same time, if the charge-mediated interactions are strong enough, we will create something like a supported lipid the bilayer on the droplet periphery based on the fusion of these liposomes. And if this happens in the complete droplet periphery, as shown in this um, um, time-lapse image here, we'll create around the whole droplet such a supported lipid bilayer. So what you see here is one of these water and oil droplets trapped in a microfluidic device. The lipids are in this case shown in green. You will see a negatively charged surfactant being flushed into the device and you can observe how the SUVs 
will be almost instantaneously be dragged to the periphery of this droplet to form such a supportive lipid fiber. So basically what we will create is a so-called droplet stabilized giant unilamellar vesicle, a GOV. GOVs are very um, uh, commonly used structures and mimetics for synthetic cells as they kind of recapitulate some of the most uh, important features of cells, which is a compartmentalization, meaning they have a water phase inside, they have a water phase outside, and a double lipid membrane, which encloses any kind of biomolecular carbon inside. And basically, after the complete formation of these droplet stabilized GOVs, we can also then destabilize the whole emulsification release the GOVs and whatever we want to have trapped inside back into an aqueous layer. So basically cell culture medium. So this is the fundamental technique that we use and we've been using it mostly to assemble synthetic cells. But actually we had a project that was aimed um, to use these GOVs also for targeted drug delivery. This is described in a recent paper that was just, I think published one or two weeks ago. And again, we here used uh, microfluidic technology to produce very small water and oil droplets in order to obtain very small GUVs. So something that's in the border between a giant unilamellar vesicle and a large unilamellar vesicle, so an LUV. This was designed in order to encapsulate any kind of a drug or bigger supramolecular component inside the GUVs to Kind of deliver these GUVs into the intracellular space of the cell. So these are GUVs that can be interfaced with cells, small GUVs, and they're taken up by the cells actually. Um, as I said, just, just to maybe kind of give you a little bit of a teaser of this paper, um, we use these small GUVs to encapsulate viruses uh, or also supramolecular DNA uh, constructs and this was applied by us in order to get these viruses in a controlled and targeted manner into cells in order to induce uh, transgenic ex expression of, of uh, proteins in there. But at the same time, as we saw that there is a real high um, efficient uptake of these small GUVs into the intracellular space of the cells. So on the left side, there's a confocal stack of the GUVs. On the right side, there's a cytosolic staining of the cells that shows that the GUVs are actually really inside the cells. Um, we thought this, this could have further uh, applications, especially because we also developed techniques to somewhat stabilize these GUVs inside the intracellular space, meaning to evade the lysosomal degradation of these vesicular structures inside the cell and have a stable incorporation over several, several days of these GUVs. And of course, this is kind of a, a quite prominent event in biology or resembles a quite prominent uh, event in biology, which is the endosymbiotic theory or the symbi uh, symbiogenesis theory. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, the concept is uh, pretty simple. At some point in history, we had a, a prokaryotic cell that contained uh, just some genetic information inside, um, minimalistically speaking. And at some point, this cell ingest, uh, ingest uh, or took up a bacteria, uh, most likely a bacteria, and this bacterium was stably incorporated into the cell, which then give rise to eukaryotic cells. So cells that have intracellular organelles. And we thought about why not use our GV system to study this process, to mimic this process and then study it, of course. So basically, why should we not take cells that have an organelle like their nucleus that have organelles like the mitochondria and add additional synthetic organelles into their cytosolic space. So the whole idea of the paper that we published in small is integrate GUV based synthetic organelles into cells at least for a time frame of several hours and uh, to explore what, what we could do with these synthetic cells. Yeah, this was a, it was a very explorative um, project. Um, we came up with three different concepts that we wanted to explore. First, we wanted only to mimic an existing function of an organelle within a cell. The second concept was we wanted to redesign 
the cell, the functionality of an already existing organelle within a cell. And lastly, the aim was to implement a completely new organelle function within a cell. When I speak about cells, I always mean human cells. This concept could be used also for non-human cells, other mammalian cells, but we only work with uh, human cells in this case. So for the first uh, kind of strategy, we were uh, looking at peroxisomes. Uh, for the second strategy, we looked at buffer, uh, at calcium buffering organelles like the mitochondria. And the last one, um, this is a, a concept that mostly dealt, uh, dealt with uh, magnetosome structures. So starting from the first uh, strategy, uh, the idea was to use GUVs that contain a catalyzed uh, enzyme that simply breaks down hydrogen peroxide within the cells and thereby sustains the uh, redox uh, homeostasis within the cells. Um, first, of course, uh, we checked that we can produce these uh, GUVs that harbor the uh, catalyzed enzyme inside its lumen and that these GUVs are taken up by the cells. Um, synthetic organelles, once they're taken up, we call them synthetic organelles, are able to sustain cellular redox, uh, redox homeostasis. And this we did by staining the cells with a dye that is sensitive to reactive oxygen species, so that will light up once it's oxidized by reactive oxygen species. Um, so we uh, used human keratinocyte monolayers uh, as redox homeostasis, kind of an important concept in uh, skin, especially, um, we use keratinocytes. And these keratinocytes were uh, either um, treated, or these keratinocytes were treated with a compound that induces oxidative stress in them, and they either harbored these synthetic peroxisomes, so synthetic organelles, or they lacked them. And we quantified simply the um, fluorescence of these cell redox dye as a measure of the oxidative stress of the cells, and we could basically show that the synthetic peroxisomes sustain cellular redox homeostasis and um, basically support the cells to an, 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 um, equilibrating back to their original or favorable um, redox homeostasis after oxidative stress is induced. So this was already the first proof of concept that we can design somewhat of a synthetic organelles inside, but of course it's a very simple system um, that's just based on the incorporation of a uh, itself active uh, enzyme into a GUV. So we decided to um, kind of add a little bit of more complexity into the system and redesign the existing function of an organelle within a cell. So basically um, mimic a function of a cell, but with a completely different and synthetic mechanism that we designed. And for this, we turned to the um, electrophysiology, if you want to say, of cells more specifically um, into their calcium homeostasis. What I'm showing you here is a fluorescence um, time-lapse microscopy series of human fi fibroblasts that are either stained with a cytosolic dye that lights up as soon there's elevated calcium levels. It's on the right side and on the left side. Um, there's a very uh, similar form of this diet, which is mostly directed to the mitochondria. And when you image such a fibroblast monolayer, you will see that there are individual cells, we call them pacemaker cells, that will spontaneously fire calcium action potentials. So basically, they will elevate their intracellular calcium levels. And there are two important organelles involved in this process. The first one are the mitochondria, the second one is the, second one is the endoplasmatic reticulum. Um, what you can see when you quantify these um, intensities over time, you will see that you always have a pacemaker cell, which is here in the cell number one, that induces also a change in the calcium levels of another cell that is in contact with this pacemaker cell. And these we call the follower cells. This whole uh, pacemaker follower cell system is an important tool um, that applies calcium as a kind of a second messenger, uh, which will trigger a transcriptional activation of specific genes, uh, either directly in the, in the pacemaker cell or in the follower cell. So it's a very interesting system 
electrophysiological system um, that has impact not only in fibroblasts, but in many other cell types. So the basic idea of our next synthetic organelle was to implement GOVs into cells that contain a calcium, uh, calcium which was caged with a uh, UV-sensitive um, chelator, it's, uh, this NP-EGTA, which will basically release calcium inside the GUV once the GUV is illuminated with UV light. Um, to study this, if it's in general possible at all to release uh, calcium within a GUV, if this calcium will pass through the lipid membrane of the GUV into the, uh, or outside of the GUV, we first studied the whole uh, UV mediated G uh, calcium release process inside water in oil droplets, which is shown in this uh, time-lapse uh, time uh, microscopy images here. So basically we use droplets um, that contain GUVs, this in, in yellow is the GUV, uh, with the calcium chelated inside, and a fluorescence calcium indicator integrated into our droplet. And what you could see when we illuminated um, this one specific droplet with UV light, that it's not only that we see an increase in the uh, fluorophore, so the calcium indicator fluorescent within the GUV, but within the whole droplet, which kind of uh, assured us somehow that once calcium is released inside the GUV, it will pass diffused by diffusion through the lipid membrane outside of this GUV. So um, like in the, in, like I, I showed you before, it will pass out of the mitochondria, which we're trying to mimic into the cytosolic space. So the next step was pretty clear to load these synthetic organelles into the cells. This is again a fibroblast monolayer. Um, on the left side, there is the cell monolayer, again, labeled with a calcium indicator. You can already see there is some um, background activity, so spontaneous uh, firing of these uh, calcium action potentials. And then there's this one uh, cell that incorporates many of our GUVs inside that were loaded with uh, chelated calcium. We Ill illuminate the specific cell, which led to firing of uh, uh, action potentials inside the cell. But most importantly, also in some of the connected cells, we could see increased uh, firing of these calcium action potentials. So taking together this kind of uh, illustrates that we were able to design and implement the uh, functionality of the calcium buffering um, capabilities of mitochondria, but also if you want to say so of, of uh, the endoplasmatic reticulum and establish a synthetic pacemaker follower cell system, which is of course responsive to light. So it mimics an existing function of cells, but with a very different synthetic mechanism. Okay, so everything I showed you until now are uh, cellular functionalities that are somewhat intrinsic to mammalian cells already. So the last step that we took was to mimic the functionality of an organelle that's actually not existing in the mammalian world at all. And these are magnetosomes. So the idea was to transplant the functionality of an organelle that you might find in a specific uh, branch of the phylogenetic tree and transplant this functionality into a completely other branch of the phylogenetic tree. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with magnetosomes, these are uh, lipid enclosed um, primitive organelles found in a different kind of bacteria. They contained or contain iron-based nanoparticles, so to say. And the bacteria use these kind of unlined organelles to sense and respond or, or move along magnetic fields, so to orientate themselves within the magnetic field of the Earth. Why we thought that this is a good uh, thing that we might be able to uh, mimic in a, in a mammalian cell system is because when we looked at our synthetic organelles, which is shown here on the left side in an actin staining, we always uh, uh, came across the fact that the synthetic organelles are tightly connected to the cytoskeleton of the cells. We don't know yet exactly why this is the case, but there seems to be a lot of actin involved around the synthetic organelles. 
Uh, second of all, um, the interesting thing about our technique for the GV production is that we can easily incorporate magnetic nanoparticles into the lumen of the uh, GVs. And these nanoparticles are, are iron-based nanoparticles. They're responsive to extrinsic magnetic fields that we apply, uh, as you can see in, in, in these time-lapse videos. So um, we thought about taking these systems as a primitive mimic of the magnetosomes from bacteria, um, transplant them into mammalian cells, um, simply culture the mammalian cells next to a magnet or a strong magnet actually, and see if we can induce a magnetotactic behavior inside the cells. Uh, we were not confident at all uh, at the beginning that it would work, but actually this was one of the nice experiments that you have that you try on the first try and you already get quite a good result and you're very happy with it because it seems to be a very um, uh, stable system actually. So on the left side, I'm showing you here the uh, fluorescent staining of the synthetic organelles in again, a fibroblast monolayer. And if we zoom in into this, um, in the bright field image, uh, which um, gives you a good contrast of the, of the iron nanoparticles, we could already see that these organelles seem to align somehow according to the magnetic field that we were using or that these cells were cultured next to. And we also looked at uh, on the electron microscopy level, and we could see some indication that there seems to be a preferential orientation of these magnetic nanoparticles within the lumen of the GOEs once taken up by the cells. So this is a good structural analysis, but it doesn't tell us anything about the functionality of these synthetic magnetosomes. This is why we did a kind of a simple uh, proof of concept experiments. We cultured these monolayers of cells in a well, um, in a, of a well plate. We imaged the whole well plate. So this is uh, the, the nuclei of all the cells. This is the actin staining of the cells. And these are the synthetic organelles of the cells. Um, in one case, without a magnet, which will result in a quite even distribution of uh, the cells within the well, but once we place the magnet next to the cells, you will see the magnet position is now indicated by this gray bar here, that the cells somehow seem to sense the magnetic field and seem at least partially to migrate to the magnet side, which you can see in the quantification of the cell numbers on the right side. So this already gives us somewhat of a functional assessment that these synthetic organelles actually do work inside the cells and that the functionality was transplanted based on the design of an organelle that is not at all intrinsic to mammalian cells. So basically we equipped um, with the synthetic magnetosomes cell types in a way to give them a, magnetic sen a magnetosensitive phenotype, which allows them to, to migrate in the magnetic field. Um, you might ask, why is this interesting? And this, unfortunately, for the moment, the only thing that um, somewhat points to application of, of the whole procedures that I'm showing you here is the current system that I'm showing you on the magnetosomes also works for primary neuronal cells. Um, again, in the upper side, um, you can see cells that were cultured next to a magnet um, with the synthetic uh, magnetosomes. And on the lower side, these are cells without synthetic magnetosomes, so primary hip hippocampal neurons from uh, rats. Uh, and this is actually kind of a challenging thing to direct the migration of neurons uh, because, and it's interesting because it opens some therapeutic uh, possibilities, of course, in the far future to uh, also promote the elongation and extension of neuronal connections, as you can see in the right pictures. Okay, so um, this gave us, uh, uh, I think, quite of a good fundament um, to proceed with the uh, assembly, bottom-up assembly of synthetic organelles, and it provides us with uh, some good arguments and proofs that such synthetic organelles are actually functional inside cells. Um, I just want to highlight for a conclusion the very um, uh, basic things that we achieved, I think, which is the high throughput production of synthetic organelles, uh, the demonstration that these synthetic organelles are taken up into the intracellular space by mammalian cells, 
and that these synthetic organelles can be equipped with uh, operational modules that allow either to mimic the structure and function of natural cell uh, natural organelles or to really redesign the structure and function of synthetic organelles within the mix cells. So what's, what's next? I said in the beginning, we're still working on this and it was proof of concept study. Um, there are, I think, two things I would like to um, mention in this case. Uh, first, uh, I think synthetic organelles um, and the ability to construct these very complex structures um, might open up in the far future new therapeutic possibilities. So we might be able to engineer therapeutic machineries that are operable within the intracellular space. And of course, this is not so much now related to an application, but of course is a very fundamental problem in, in synthetic biology, but very interesting for, for the whole of biology, which is the holy grail of, of synthetic organelles. And this is to somehow engineer synthetic organelles that are able to uh, reproduce within cells and to be replicated uh, within the cell cycle of the cells, because only this would actually allow for a true fusion of synthetic organelles with living cells. Um, we have some conceptual ideas how to do so. I would be very happy to discuss with you uh, what we have in mind. We have no uh, real uh, technical plan how we're going to solve this but i think there are also many other synthetic organelles in the literature that have been trying this and i'm i'm actually very positive that this will be achieved at some point within the next years to present intracellular synthetic organelles that are able to replicate with the cell cycle so this basically leaves me with uh, thanking all the people that were involved in this research it's mostly my pi professor Spatz. Uh, and my group, group leader, Ilya Platzmann, um, that uh, guided me on the path on the development of these synthetic organelles, as well as all of my students that were involved in this, um, the funding agencies of the work, uh, mostly the um, Max Planck Center for Minimal Biology in Bristol, as well as my graduate schools, many of the cooperation partners, Imre Berger actually from Bristol, he was the one who approached us um, with the idea of using GOVs for an intracellular delivery. So he somewhat started this. Um, and of course, um, last but not least, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm very, very much looking forward for the discussion. Thanks so much, Oscar. Amazing. It's really very lovely paper. Thank you. And, uh, I mean, I love, I love synthetic biology. Whenever I see this kind of things, like, Amazing, this is the way to go. So I think by tradition, um, I start with my own questions. Okay. Now, so first of all, I think um, I really like the magnetism stuff. It's, um, so what, what, what is the critical concentration of the GUVs that you can put in a cell so that they can actually react to a moderate magnetic field? Um. So, so you're basically pointing towards the quantitative effects um, right. in general of the, of the synthetic organelles. So I started my talk with uh, basically advertising that uh, minimal systems are very nice for biology because they are so well controlled, uh, because they're so uh, isolated in terms of their environment. And then I said that uh, uh, what I like to do is to interface these well controlled systems with synthetic cells and this messes up the whole concept because in, uh, uh, with natural cells and this kind of messes up the whole concept because cells do whatever they want at some point. Yeah? And as I showed in some of the images, um, some of the cells take up the synthetic organelles uh, and some almost not. Yeah? And we don't know why this is the case at the end. So we have yet no means to control or to induce a homogeneous uptake of the synthetic organelles, at least in the cell types that we've been using so far. So this is why in general, it's hard for the moment to get quantitative ideas of how it's working. But I think um, what we see in, in the, especially for the magnetosomes now, we can see it uh, quite good because we have such a good uh, contrast in the, in the bright field. Uh, it seems to be 
the case that, that we need something above 20 to 30 organelles within a single cell in order to direct the migration. This is just a rough estimate to the moment. And uh, this could be used for wound healing, no? Because the migration of the cells and the wound healing is so important. Um, if you can actually engineer it so that you fasten this process. Yes, yes. So we have uh, many projects that deal with wound healing uh, here in the department, um, mostly from a biophysical perspective. Um, and of course, for wound healing, what matters is not the, so much the migration of single cells, but the collective migration of cells. This is especially important. And for this scenario, what you will need to induce for a sustainable collective migration is the formation of so-called leader cells. So single cells within a monolayer that will somehow drag or direct the whole collective behind them for a migration. Um, and I think the, the whole, and this I agree completely with you, this magnetosome technology could uh, help to promote the formation of these leader cells. I think the cells themselves, keratinocytes themselves, once activated for migration are strong enough to migrate by themselves yeah, if the substrate and so on is, is good enough. But I think the very critical point is the induction of these leader cells. And this is something that have been looking somewhat into it and we see that there's an effect. Um, but unfortunately there's uh, uh, not enough critical data for the moment that, that I can draw any, any definitive conclusion on this. Thank you, Oscar. So, uh... I'll ask one of the questions from the audience. So Alexander Rabane is asking, basic biology question. Why are these GUVs taken up by the cells? As far as I know, membrane-coated viruses need specialized machinery to enter the cells. Why does this not apply here? Yeah. Um, so we started the whole um, targeted delivery project by GUVs actually with the very same question. Why, so we, we incubated GUV cells and we saw strong uptake and we, we were thinking, why is this actually happening? And I think there are two critical factors that will induce this. First is the charge. These GUVs that we use, they are charged. And there will be a charge dependent uptake of GUVs with cells. And this is, um, I think, because of two reasons. First, because there's a direct charge associated interaction between GUVs and cells. But second, the charge will also induce a coding of the GUVs with serum proteins that are present in the media, in the subculture media. So the GUVs um, will be somewhat co somehow coded with serum proteins. And these most likely will mimic the activation, either specific or unspecific activation of endocytotic mechanisms uh, within a cell once a GUV gets in contact with the cell. And we've been studying this by, by confocal microscopy, and we see that actually the uptake is very fast uh, once a GUV attaches to a cell. So um, I think the, the other thing I need to mention for this is we've been using cells that intrinsically have a high membrane turnover. So there's a lot of endocytotic machinery present within the cells, mm -hmm. and fibroblast cells, also neuronal cells. Um, some dendritic cells, um, which certainly aids the uptake of the synthetic organelles. Um, we can, I mean, it's described in this biomaterials paper that, that I mentioned in the beginning. We can also code the GUVs with uh, specific ligands, integrating ligands, for instance, that will then additionally promote the uptake of the GUVs. But for the moment, with the synthetic organelles, it's mostly passive uptake. And uh, when you say it's charged, which kind of lipids do you use on the surface? And this small GUVs that you mentioned, they're not really coated. Um, they're not encapsul encapsulated because the first you show that the GUVs that you form, they're encapsulated by this uh, surfactant. Exactly. Yeah. So um, the small ones, the small ones that you use, are they also encapsulated or they're free? The small ones, they are produced by the very same technique of these water and oil droplet production. But once released out of this polymer shell of the droplet, um, we know, this described in the Nature Materials paper, um, that there's no surfactant and no polymer coating the GUV. So these are from what we see nascent GUVs without any coating. And to your first question, 
um, the the GWs that I was showing you here are GWs that are composed of PC, PG, and cholesterol lipids mostly. Um, and of course, additionally, some uh, fluorescently conjugated lipids to image them and so on. Um, but the general technique of charge mediated formation within water and oil droplets is uh, it can be used with uh, almost every um, lipid composition um, as long as there is a charge involved. So non-charged GVs are pretty hard to produce, although it's somewhat possible, but it's very challenging to do so. And it would be maybe interesting as well to, to know if, uh, if, the, if you change the charge, so PG negatively charged, but if you use lipids like DOTAP, for instance, would it increase interactions and endocytosis? Exactly. So, um, so if you're interested in this, I can really just direct you to the biomaterials paper because there we did a lipid screening of different charges and different lipids. Uh, it certainly has a big influence on the interaction of the vesicle with the cell. Um, but yeah, I really, of course, I would be happy if you read the paper. <laughs> um, uh, but I can say if you use DOTAP lipids, uh, you will mostly see a fusion of the GUVs with the cell. Yeah, it will okay. yeah, be charged liposome, if you will. So. Okay, so thank you. Next question is by NS Akius, and he says, thanks for the presentation. Do you also take into account the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi in this kind of cargo procedure? Um, yes, so we've mostly focused on the lysosomes, of course, because this is just, um, I think, the most common mechanism of a cell to deal with particles that uh, takes up from the extracellular space. Um, so to direct the early endosome towards lysosome fusion and degradation of these particles. And of course, the lysosomes are quite easy to stain. So we have analyzed the time-dependent dynamics of the GOV uptake, especially for the lysosome. But um, we can also, of course, track the fluorescence of the GOVs inside the cell. And we see extensive perinuclear accumulation of the lipid fluorescence which is for us an indication that at least the Golgi and the ER are somewhat involved. Although at this stage, the lipids are not so much anymore in a vesicular-like structure, but seem to be more diffusive. So maybe there is uh, either active or passive transition of the um, GOB lipids to the intracellular lipids of the intracellular organelles. Um, we see this, but we don't understand anything uh, for the moment. Great. So uh, related to this, can you actually change the shape of the vesicles instead of spherical? Can you make it, for instance, um, you know, long longitudinal? Um, yes, we have some primitive uh, techniques to do this. I, I'm the most, most common way to do this is, of course, uh, playing with the osmotics. So to deflate the GUVs and, uh, and you will achieve certain um, vesicle structures and architectures depending on the osmotics. But we, as I said, we are also able to integrate, integrate um, structural proteins or synthetic polymers into the lumen of the GUVs, um, like cytoskeletal proteins or um, uh, longer polymers, and that will then influence the structure of the GUVs, but it's yet not really controlled, I would say. And what about the stability? Once they are taken up by the cells, how long do they stay in the cells till mm -hmm. If you don't protect them from degradation, how long would they stay? This again depends a lot on the cell types. I can tell you for the human fibroblast that we are using, um, once a GUV is taken up by the cell, you will, we, if we quantify the fluorescence of the GUVs, you will see uh, that they have a, a half lifetime of about 24 hours. So the degradation is quite fast. Um, we can integrate some polymers into the GUVs to extend this, of course. Um, but it were, kind of well correlates with a, what is known about lipo, or other liposome technologies with the stability of the GUVs inside the cells. Okay, so uh, one practical question. If I want to implement this microfluidics uh, methodology in my lab to produce this small size of GUVs in high quantities, is it a big trouble? Uh, what do I need in terms of uh, so, um, I think there, there are two answers to this question. First answer, uh, answer is if 
you use a microfluidic technology and you're not experienced with microfluidics, um, you will have the, let's say, standard troubles and standard troubleshooting of implementing microfluidics. And once you have this, it's actually not very challenging. It's a quite robust system to do this. Um, but there's also a second option to produce them, which uh, gives you even higher yields um, and faster production uh, processes, which is not any more dependent on microfluidics. This we published in a paper in ACS Synthetic Biology, which is a one pot um, production uh, technique. So basically you can perform the whole process within an epi and it induces the formation of these water and oil droplets by shear forces due to mechanical agitation, so basically vortex. So um, we hear from people that have been using our technique in their lab without us helping a lot that managed to establish this within babies. So once you have the reagents, they're not so expensive. It's uh, quite simple to establish this, um, especially if you don't want to use the microfluidic technology. I'll chase, chase you on this one. Um, next question by Alexander Rabanis says, thank you for the previous answer. I was wondering why you choose the charge mediated formation of GUVs as opposed to other methods. Yeah, so I think there are many reasons to do so, and there are also some reasons not to do so, I would say. Yeah. So um, first, when it comes to um, screening conditions, uh, as I said, the whole project was based on this uh, targeted delivery paper um, where we screened a lot. Um, conventional methods like uh, electroformation of GUVs is um, certainly a limiting factor concerning the throughput. So we are talking about screenings with 20 to 30, 96 well plates, several conditions. Um, you would take quite a long time by electro standard electroformation techniques to get such high numbers of GUVs. Um, the second one is that even if you get these high numbers of GUVs with electroformation methods, you will have not have the same level of control over the GUV size, for instance, but also about their composition. They're not as flexible in the composition as with the droplet uh, stabilized version of GUV formation. And uh, third of all, I mean, and this might be one of the most uh, important um, aspects concerning the magnetosomes, incorporating nanoparticles or even microparticles into GUVs with other forms is challenging. I would say more challenging than with this method. Thanks, Oscar. So the next questions, actually, two people asking in the similar line, Sahar Alizada and Arda Khan Uner. So the first question is, um, can this method be used for cell vega syndrome, which is characterized by the reduction or absence of functional paroxysms? And what would be the limitations of this? And the second question by Arda is also in the same line, saying that if these synthetic organelles are used in organelle-related diseases in the future, can the defective organelle in the cell suppress communication with DNA and other signals and be involved in this process? More, I mean, in a nutshell, uh, where do you see if these uh, systems can be applicable in, in therapies? Yeah, I mean, for the moment, it's uh, pure speculation. Yeah, I mean, the, um, so the institute where we work here is the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research. Although it says medical research, we are mostly doing research that is aimed to find an application not next year, not in the next five years, but maybe in 40, 50 or 100 years. So it's very fundamental. Um, this is why I, I need to stress that it's pure speculation, but I really hope that synthetic organelles, um, either this system I showed you or other systems, at some point will be truly integrated into living cells, meaning that they replicate with the cell cycle that once applied to a cell, you will have them in your cells. Um, when this is achieved, I think that there is a really wide variety of options, therapeutic options that you could explore. As I showed you, I think there's, there's a proof of concept in this study that um, these synthetic organelles can replace or sustain natural organelle function also with a therapeutic perspective at the end. 
Um, it might be that we need to include genetics into these organelles. So any kind of, a, for instance, DNA-based genetic system that allows for programmable um, behavior of the synthetic cells inside, uh, of the synthetic organelles within the cells. Um, of course, it's, it's not clear yet, yeah, but um, I think it's, it's quite easy to foresee, especially in the, in the uh, peroxisome case, um, that if you're able to sustain cellular redox homeostasis and decomposition of reactive oxygen species, that this might have a quite direct therapeutic link, which does not mean, this I need to stress uh, uh, because of fairness, that it's the most efficient way to do so. Yeah, there might be small molecular drugs or whatever that do a better job, but certainly the organelles offer the possibility to full, fulfill more complex functions than simply small molecular, uh, small molecular drugs or antibodies or whatever. They can, as I said, include genetic programs that make them more dynamic, more responsive and so on. Awesome, thank you, thank you. I don't have any more questions in the list. So that was fantastic. Thanks a lot, Oscar. It was a pleasure for me to have you here today. For me too, I really enjoyed the discussion. Thanks a lot. So good luck for the future and uh, we'll be following you and uh, your work in the future. Uh, thank you, see you.